Welcome, welcome everybody to our teaching of pronunciation webinar. Today is August 27th, 2021. So we're going to be doing a presentation on examining the use of technology in developing prosody. And we're going to be uh, talking a little bit about what you can do in your classes to help your students learn about prosody and how are we going to do this? It's going to be Carla. Carla Liu is going to talk about that and show us a few things that might be useful in our classes. In the meanwhile, participants, how about you go and click on the chat and introduce yourselves. So don't be shy. Click chat. Type your name and where you are and a little bit of something about us so that we feel like we are in together land. So here I am. I'm in Sunnyvale, California. Where is everybody else? So let's see who's here. Don't be shy. You know your teachers. You like to talk and teachers of pronunciation. Oh, goody, goody, goody. Of course, we've got Carla. And my right, my right hand man, my assistant in the top coordinator position, Randy Reitmeyer. Hello, Amber in Los Angeles. Hello, Sharon, zooming from LA County. And how do we say MGP? How do we pronounce that, Ms. Ms. or Ms. Espinosa? Uh, I'm Guadalupe. It's an abbreviation. It's so Guadalupe. long. Guadalupe. Oh, so is yeah. MGPE a abbreviation for Guadalupe? Yes, because uh, I, I often get confused by Maria, but I go by Guadalupe, my middle name. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the M stands for Maria and Guadalupe? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, uh -huh. Maria Guadalupe. Nice to know that. I like to, every day for me, I consider every day a learning day. So that's something, that's just one of the things I've learned today. And okay. Christy, Christy from Oceanside. North San Diego. Welcome, welcome. And some other people are you typing into the uh, box? Type your name and where you are and maybe say hello to us. It's fine if you do so because we are a nice cozy group. And because we are teachers of pronunciation, we like to talk. <laughs> And I see some other faces that are about to put their names up here. For example, I see Nat. Hi there. Hello. Hi everyone. Hi. You can type in the chat if you'd like to to tell us where you're where you're coming in from. Okay, sure. And that's from New Brunswick, Canada, a little bit, a little bit higher than where I am in California, <laughs> maybe a little cooler than where we are here. What's the temperature in New Brunswick? Looking it up, I can tell that. <laughs> Meanwhile, we've got Seth from Palo Alto. That's near me. Oh, you're in the 90s. Oh, she okay. says you're in the 90s. That's uh, that's warmer than it is here now. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, uh, you're getting the coastal 90s. That's kind of a, an unusual thing for us at this time of year. But I think we're going to be in that neighborhood yeah. uh, today here in Silicon Valley. I wish. I think the coast is much more comfortable. I'll put it that way. <laughs> well, the coast is kind of comfortable if you have a little bit of ocean breeze, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, those of you who um, have been coming to our top sessions, which we've been having every month. Yes. Um, you probably know us. I am Marsha. Uh, Marsha Chan. I am the top co-founder and a co-coordinator, along with Jadine Elvin from uh, CSU Fresno. She's at Fresno State. She's not able to be with us today, but she is here 
in spirit. And of course, Randy Reitmeyer, our assistant coordinator for this year, she is here with us today as well. Some of you are members of CATISOL, which is wonderful, and so you know about our benefits for being a CATISOL member. Some of you are not yet members, but you may consider why you should be a member, because we are a really vibrant community, and we have a lot that we can share with each other. Uh, and nowadays, it doesn't mean that you have to be located in California to be part of our group. We do have members who actually reside in other parts of the world. You have access to our peer-reviewed language publications at Katisla Journal, which you can find by clicking on the about communication on our website. Uh, we also put out uh, Katisla update announcements at least once a month, if not more. Um, if you're a member, you get discounts to regional and state conferences. You, of course, have free access to an unlimited number of interest groups like TOP and other areas, for example, up to your, uh, your levels uh, like K-12 or adult or community college, that sort of thing, and to chapters which were um, pre-pandemic and probably post-pandemic more important when we do face-to-face -face gatherings and you actually have meetings in your geographical area. But online, you know, you can interact with us. Uh, we have networking and learning and teaching with lots of members at conferences and other kinds of events. So we hope that you'll consider us because we have, you know, online discussions with our um, message boards. Some of you who are looking for a job will find it useful to go to the job bank and see what, what's out there for, um, for different kinds of uh, jobs in different places in the state. We have resources and we do have grants through our Katisal Educational Foundation. So there are a number of grants and awards for both teachers and students. And what I mean students, you know, we're talking about students who are coming into the field of teaching English as a second language. Um, so we have a lot of opportunities. Now today we're going to hear from um, Carla Liu, who is from where? From the- Riverside. Uh, sorry? Oh, I'm sorry, Riverside. <laughs> You, is that where you're living now? You're living in Riverside? Yes, yes. Okay, that's awesome. And you teach at the Cap, uh, see the California Baptist University, right? I, and yes. some of the things that you do, tell us what you do as you are, you coordinate certain programs. Yeah, um, well, I when I started here at CBU about 15 years ago, I was the director of an intensive English program. Mm -hmm. And I did that for about six years. Um, now I'm on the other side um, after teaching, you know, ESL for uh, over 20 years. I'm now on the other side training teachers. And so my colleague and I are building a TESOL program and we currently have a TESOL certificate, a minor, and we are working on a master's in TESOL as well. That is great. And tell us something about the award that you and your co-author won recently from Katisal. So, yeah. you know, we do have awards. Yeah. Here we have yeah. an award winner. Yeah. yeah, that was a really exciting process. Um, I got my doctorate at Alliant International University and noticed at one of the Katisal um, uh, Katisal conferences that there was an opportunity to um, submit a journal article uh, for, you know, to share research. And so my colleague and I, um, uh, we put Renee Benton, we uh, wrote an article about, which was actually related to my dissertation. Um, she was a participant as a classroom teacher. And so together we put this article um, together and we won the award and we were able to be at the conference, I, I believe it was a couple of falls ago where we were presented with that. And then only just recently in the spring, um, we were able to get that into the Cotisal Journal. Right, good. Okay, so thank you for your good work. And today you're going to give us some tidbits from your research and um, maybe some practical application. Yes. Yes. Well, why don't you just go ahead with it? Would, would you like to put on your... Um, yeah, I'll share my screen. Want to share your screen? Okay. Yeah, and um, I'll go ahead and and put my um, 
share my uh, PowerPoint in there. Are you are you able to see? Okay. Whoops. All right. Okay. It says that you started sharing screen, and now we see it. All right. That's great. Okay. I'm. You know what? I'm gonna stop share, and I want to put this because I don't want my head turning sideways. So I'm gonna share. I want to share this screen that we're on here, and bring that up. Okay. Can you see that now? Yes. Okay. Great. All right. So. Um, to play it safe, I think um, I was going to put this in slideshow, but I noticed that some of my recordings were kind of going a bit batty um, through that. So I, I'm going to go ahead and um, I'm going to start it in slideshow, but then I'm going to pop out of that uh, just because the, the recordings don't seem to work quite as well. So okay. I'll, I'll go ahead and, and try that. Uh, here we go. All right. So, so this um, I entitled this presentation "Examining the Use of Technology in Developing Prosody." And um, basically, what I want to do here is not go over. I'm going to introduce the research, but I really don't want that to be the focus because um, really I'm not a researcher at heart. I'm a practitioner, and when I um, had to design a research project for my dissertation. I really wanted to focus on something that would have practical use for ESL instructors. Um, so it would have purpose. And, um, and this is where Renee uh, was a big help in um, working with me on this. So, um, so let me just briefly talk about the research project itself, just to kind of give you a context before we focus on some of the, the techniques that uh, we uh, that I used. Um, so basically, this was the methodology of this research was a mixed method approach, which just means that I used qualitative and quantitative uh, measures for this. Um, but what I did was it's it's really a pilot study because we have a rather small um, intensive English program here, and so uh, I worked with um, Renee was teaching a presentation course. And so I used her students from that course and she just had eight students. And so, um, so it was a small group, but it, it gave me a chance to really kind of test this out. Um, I, I did a pre-test in the beginning, just had them do an impromptu speech. And, um, and then I did 14 weeks, um, well, actually it was more like 12, 12 weeks of you know, giving them some, uh, some instruction and practice with the technology tools. And yeah, I also focused on a noticing and reformulation technique as well, which I'm not gonna go into with this presentation. I'm really gonna focus on the technology itself. Um, and then afterwards we did a, a post-test and it was exactly the same thing, another impromptu uh, speech and recorded it. And those were then given to, um, to readers or raters uh, who were non-experts and they were jumbled up so they had no idea who, who said what. Um, and I mixed that up with another comparison group. And I purposely chose non-expert raters because our intensive English program students will, will transition into undergraduate programs with professors who aren't used to international students. And so I wanted to get their take on whether or not they noticed any difference after the, the treatment. Um, what I try to do when I put this research together was to try to triangulate in the sense that, um, try to get data from a number of different sources so that um, there could be some comparison and uh, greater validity with, uh, with that. So, um, so Renee, in, when she was teaching her presentation class, um, I told her don't teach anything about pronunciation. That's gonna be my job but focus on the presentation skills and give me any kind of feedback. I gave her a, um, a rating chart and then she would rate that according to the prosody. And then after the whole uh, pre-test and post-test, I did a student questionnaire and um, they just kind of responded to some multiple choice questions. And then after that, um, I brought the students together and asked them some questions so they could then give more information about their responses to the questionnaire. 
So that was the basic method methodology for the research itself, just to give you an idea of that. And at the end of this presentation, I will share some of the results, some of the um, responses of the students that were kind of interesting from their own experience. So um, like I said, what I really wanna do in this presentation is just focus on the technology that was used because that was really where my interest was. Um, when I was uh, teaching in the IEP, um, I was the administrator, but I was also an instructor. And uh, I, I really enjoyed working with the pronunciation classes. Um, but at the time in our lab, I had bought, um, our, our program had a, um, a prepackaged pronunciation tool that we used in our lab. Um, but what I found frustrating is that if I wanted to work on something specific, I couldn't do that because it was all prepackaged. And so I really wanted to see, are there any tools out there um, that I could use and that way um, kind of create my own kind of um, uh, exercises that would fit in with what I was teaching. All right. And I also wanted to find something that was user friendly because, um, you know, my husband's a computer programmer, but I'm not. I'm not, I'm not, you know, strong in technology. I've learned a lot, but I'm not, you know, a strong technological person. And so I wanted to find something that was user friendly and also something that was affordable because a lot of these prepackaged programs are very expensive. And so um, in my research, I came across two. Uh, the first one is Audacity, and the second one was Wasp. And I forgot all about my poll. <laughs> so um, let, me, um, let me first, before I go on from here, let me do a quick, it's like um, there's about four of you that have used Audacity, and uh, one has used Wasp, but most of you haven't used either. So hopefully in me sharing this, um, you will be able to see how how, um, uh, how, how you could make use of both of these technologies. So, okay, thank you so much for doing that. Uh, let me go ahead and go back to my, my slide share here. Um, and I guess I'll just go ahead and leave it on this view. Um, so let, let me talk briefly about why I chose these two. Um, of course, I mentioned both are free, um, easy to download online. And um, they're pretty user-friendly. You kind of have to play around with them, get to use them, used to them, but you can also find some uh, instructions and tips um, online about how to use them. Now, Audacity was really developed for um, like syncing music and things like that, but more and more um, pronunciation instructors are discovering Audacity. And, and as we saw, some of you have already used this as a tool uh, for pronunciation practice. The nice thing about Audacity is that um, it shows you a waveform, which then gives um, the students a, a visual. So in my research, what I'm finding is that, you know, we often think of pronunciation as just being auditory, but uh, by giving them another way to be able to see the, the speech sounds, adds to that knowledge. And so here we not only have the auditory, but also the visual and showing them how to look at the visual so that they can see um, how their pronunciation is being formed. And uh, the other nice thing about Audacity is that um, you can share a model and then the student can record their voice. And so they can see both the model and yours, their own uh, together on there. Um, and there's some other um, advantages to that as well. Now, uh, WASP, the reason I chose WASP is that um, with Prosody, Prosody really focuses mostly on stress, rhythm, and intonation. And so I found that Audacity was really helpful with looking at stress and rhythm, but it did not deal with pitch. And so I found this other technology that focuses on pitch scales. And so I used this when I would 
teach and train students about intonation. And so I will show you both of these and how I use them um, in regards to prosody. So as I mentioned before, prosody focuses on stress, rhythm, and intonation. And um, what I did with the students was I kind of broke up the, the session, so the 14 weeks, so that we spent, um, and actually, again, it was like 12 weeks. So we spent about four weeks on stress, four on rhythm, and then four on intonation. And with that, I would present to them information about um, how stress is used in English. And then I would give them practice on audacity and they would uh, send their recordings to me. I would be able to give them feedback and uh, then they were able to make any adjustments to their own speech, all right? And did the same with each one of these, okay? And basically I came up with a general schedule. So this is just a portion of it where I focused on different aspects and they'd have a chance to practice with the tool. And, um, and then I kind of do a, a sum up before I would move on to the next phase. And that's how it was broken down. All right. So now what I'm going to do from here, that's the general idea of what I did with uh, the group. Um, let me go to um, how I use the two tools. All right, so let's first talk about um, stress. And I'm just gonna touch on a few key items um, as we move along here to save time, all right? So one of the things that I, uh, presented to the students was the difference between stress time and syllable timed language. Now, um, if you've done any research on this, um, you might be very familiar with it. There is some controversy about it. You know, not everybody agrees that this is valid, but, um, but there's some, some aspects of it that we can see the difference between languages. And it's a great starting point for students to be able to start noticing their own language speech as opposed to English. And so uh, one of the things that I would present to the students is, um, especially since the students I was working with were both Chinese and um, Native Indian, not Native Indian, I'm sorry, from India. So they were Indians and um, Chinese students. And so we would talk about a stress, English being a stress time language, which basically means that um, typically your content words would have the stress in a sentence, and this would create a speech music that kind of created this, this nice rhythm throughout. So the birds abandoned the forest. They built their nests in the orchard. And so those content words, as opposed to the function words, would get the stress. Whereas in some language, and it would look something like this in a visual, um, some languages would have stress uh, almost every word in a sentence. And so this would create a real, um, a different kind of rhythm. So when every uh, syllable is stressed. And so that's how it would differentiate from English. And so then I would give examples using audacity and uh, teaching them and showing them um, how to analyze the waveform to see this stress. Um, and syllable focus. And so here is a sample of a sentence in English where we see the alternation between the stressed and the unstressed words. Now, obviously before this, I would, I would, uh, we would focus on individual words and how stress occurs in them. But here I'm just jumping right to sentence stress. All right, so for example, um, here is an English uh, sentence. They built their nests in the forest. Okay, and so then I would point out to the students, all right, so you can see here <clears throat> that in the English, um, we see that the, uh, as I mentioned before, the content words are getting the stress in the sentence, and this is showing up on the waveform as stress meaning louder, more emphasis, uh, more strength to those syllables. And we can see that here uh, with built and nest and forest. And so if we play that again, you'll see, 
let me put this here. You can see that. It's out there, that's in the forest. Okay. And so again, that alteration between the stressed and unstressed creates that speech music that has this rhythm to it, okay? And I purposely would choose sentences that exaggerate this because when we're speaking in a regular tempo or a fast tempo, we don't notice it as well. And so I um, here I actually just recorded from, um, I, I put the sentence, I could have done the sentence myself, um, or I think with this one, I also kind of just put it in Google Translate and had it create a sentence um, and would get that uh, steady rhythm, okay? So you can see that um, the dum, the dum, the de dum, the, okay? And so that stress with the, um, the different content words. Then I would compare that to other languages. And like I said, I was working with Indian and Chinese students. So I would give an example of their own languages to show the difference between the two. And so here we see this is Hindi, all right? And it's not necessarily the same sentence. It's just a sample sentence. Okay, so we notice here that you can hear some pitch changes in uh, her speech, but essentially the, um, the stress is almost the same throughout, okay? And so it sounds very monotone. Da, 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 da. And so we don't have a, a great difference between that stress and unstress that we hear in English, but it, it's more monotone, all right? So that is a sample with the Hindi. Now with the Chinese, it's a little bit different, um, but again, Chinese is considered a syllable time language. And so let's look at a sample here. Now Chinese have their own tones, right? To each word, whereas English has um, tonal changes or pitch changes between phrases. And so it's a little bit different there. So uh, the, those tone changes, you can kind of hear them, but what happens here, it's a lot more staccato. So da, 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 da. And so if you were listening um, to Chinese, it can sound more almost machine gun-like, you know, that da, 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 All right, um, as opposed to the English, again, the dum, the dum, the de dum, the, uh, where we have that rise and fall and that uh, stress and unstress, okay? So that gives them a basic idea of some of the differences between stressed and syllable timed. Um, and with this, then um, we would practice with some of these, with words and with phrases in order to identify those stressed and unstressed. And I'll give an example of that a little bit later. But let me first move on and talk now a little bit about rhythm. And uh, with rhythm, one of the things that we would focus on is chunking. So identifying thought groups in English sentences um, that would be at natural breaks. So these would be slight pauses between phrases in a sentence. And we would identify those. And I would walk through that with the students, uh, first showing them a sentence. So let me uh, give you a sample sentence here. I used to love to sleep late on weekends until I watched my neighbor exercising every day and looking very physically fit. Now I wake up at 5.30 in the morning. Okay, so I don't need to go that far into this. Um, I'm just going to focus on the, that first sentence there. And so I would train them or uh, help them to identify those thought groups and where to break them in a sentence. And so, um, so after having a chance to listen to that, uh, to this sentence, we see here that um, there is a pause right here. I used to love to sleep late on weekends, pause, until I watched my neighbor exercising every day, pause, and looking very physically fit. So let's uh, hear that again with the sample, see if we've got those, those breaks in the right places. 
I used to love to sleep late on weekends until I watched my neighbor exercising every day and looking very physically fit. Okay, so we can see here now some students might even say there, there is a slight pause right here and that's fine. One of the things I would talk about with the students is that it could vary. It's, there's not a right or wrong here, um, but it should be at a natural break. And um, the more you pause, the more emphasis you're trying to give to certain phrases or just trying to slow down your speech, all right? The less we pause creates faster speech. And this is really important to note when preparing presentations because when you're preparing a presentation, usually uh, we get nervous and we have a tendency to speed up our speech and then the audience misses important thoughts. So by, by teaching students uh, where to pause and how often to pause, they can actually uh, pace their presentation in a way that they um, can get their thoughts across more clearly to the audience. So let's take a look again um, here on our sample where those breaks might be. And I would have the students, now one thing you could have the students do if you were to put this in a slide like this one is to actually have them write in where those breaks would be. And so here um, is actually the break between weekends and until. Here is the break between day and and, and this is the end of your sentence before carrying on. Uh, let's see if we got that right. I used to love to sleep late on weekends until I watched my neighbor exercising every day and looking very physically fit. Next. So we can see here, like I mentioned, students might even point out that there is a slight pause, very slight pause right there between neighbor and exercising, okay? So they can actually visually see those breaks in there, especially the longer that pausing is. And one of the things that I like to use is storytelling like this one, because in storytelling, we tend to dramatic, dramatic, I'm sorry, dramatize more. And so when, when, we, um, when we tell a story, we'll typically pause more or raise our voice more in order to um, emphasize and, and dramatize that the, the telling of it. And so the storytelling is a great way to be able to uh, identify these kinds of uh, thought groups, okay? So uh, there's that. Now on this next slide, I'm going to give some examples of techniques that can be used with, um, with the audacity, all right? So uh, one thing that can be done is repeat and compare. And this is really good, especially when introducing stress with individual words. And so when we are learning words, we really don't learn words based on spelling uh, to memorize them, but they get placed into our own lexicon uh, mostly by sound. And so we tend to group them by uh, stress patterns. And so learning the stress patterns of words is really helpful and essential for language learners to be able to clearly um, express themselves and be understood. And so uh, you can have students repeat a, um, after a model in order to do those comparisons. So here we have a sample of this with a repeat and compare. I don't know if you can hear that loud enough. I've got you. Can you hear it okay? All right. Let me try that again. Got this all. So. So you can see here that this is the model, and um, and the student can then compare and see that we've got ostracized. So we have the primary stress and a secondary stress here. And I put that the wrong way. So the secondary stress is on the end here. And we can see that the student has basically gotten the same kind of stress and de-stressing the middle there, all right? So 
that's one way to be able to use this. Um, another is to shadow, do shadowing on um, with uh, Audacity. And so if we had that same sentence that was used earlier, now one thing that um, that I would have the students do is I wouldn't actually have them record their own voice, but I would have them shadow after the model. So for example, it would sound something like this. I used to love to sleep late on weekends until I watched my neighbor exercising every day and looking very physically fit. Okay, so the, the student you can hear, hopefully you could hear that, is is following after the reading of the model. And so that way it it kind of guides them in um, in the, the pausing and the the tempo of the the sentence. Okay. And then finally um, another thing that could be done with audacity is students can record their own speech and then compare it to the model and then they would reformulate their speech. So they would first read out maybe a sentence of their own, then compare that to a model and then reformulate to um, you know, analyze it to determine where the breaks, the thought groups are, uh, where the stress is, and then say the sentence again and record that to see if there is any improvement in their sentence structure, their speech. Now, um, with this, again, it would be important to remind the students, it doesn't have to be exactly the same, but what you're trying to do is trying to copy that speech rhythm of the model, okay? Um, also, uh, often what I would do is have the students record and then they could submit it to me and I could then analyze and give feedback or conference with the student and give feedback and then have them record again, making adjustments and, um, and then comparing the two in order to see the, the adjustments that they've made. Okay. So that's a little bit about Audacity and we'll save um, I don't know, I haven't been watching the chat, but if, if anybody has any questions about Audacity, I guess I can stop briefly right now and just answer any questions. Well, let's say that the questions that are in the chat are not about Audacity, but there were some comments on the Indian intonation because you didn't you know, talk about the difference in intonation. And um, so one of the questions in that has is, do you believe that Indian in English speakers have kind of inverted stress, meaning that they go down on stress syllables instead of going up like development, sort of like that. And then Randy also chimed in about being familiar with that type of an inversion of intonation. Right, right. Um, that, that's a really good point. I actually haven't um, specifically studied Indian uh, stress patterns specifically. Um, I would say that there might be some truth to that, but that wasn't my main focus in this research. Okay, so, well, then you don't need to go into any, you know, you don't need to go on to that tangent. It was just one of the things that, but there are uh, comments about uh, audacity. I don't see any there. Okay, okay, great. Well, then I'll move on because now I want to talk a little bit about WASP. And like I said, uh, this was a tool that I used uh, with uh, pitch and intonation. And so um, this uh, I found a little bit more helpful in trying to teach intonation to students. Now, intonation is a really difficult um, concept to teach because um, intonation, as we know, is really um, based upon uh, the intent of the speaker. And so it can vary from sentence to sentence, depending on what the speaker wants to emphasize or get across or what kind of emotion that is put into it. 
However, there are some general rules that we can impart to the students to at least help them kind of gain some kind of um, intonation pattern, in, especially with intonational paragraphing that can be very helpful with presentations. And so I, I'm going to present a couple of them here and then give you an example to show um, how this might look in um, a presentation or a brief storytelling. So the, the first thing that um, I would introduce to students is this idea of rising and falling in pitch. And typically in English, we tend to rise on the beginning of a thought and then fall, you know, fall with some pitch change patterns, but fall toward the end. So the listener is able to identify when we rise, we're, we're starting a new thought. And when we bring down the pitch, we're ending that thought. Um, and so here's an example that I would use to point that out. Can you hear that at all? No? No, not really. Okay. Okay, did you, when you're doing, uh, and when you clicked on your share screen, um, mm -hmm. could you make sure that the, uh, you have checked the little box kind of on the bottom left that says share uh, sound from computer? On the left. Share sound. Okay, okay. let's try that again. He worked in kinesiology and helped athletes improve their movement. Can you hear that? Yes, that makes a huge difference. <laughs> okay, good. Were you able to hear the other ones? No? Okay, well, thank you for telling me that. Um, yeah, so here, um, here's the pitch pattern for that sentence. So uh, he, um, he worked in kinesiology and helped athletes improve their movement. And so here we see, I would point out to the students. Now, you can see here that I purposely paused greatly here to create the thought groups because one thing about thought groups is that each thought group has its own pitch pattern. And so this is helpful to know so that um, when we have those slight pauses, um, each chunk is gonna have its own pitch pattern. But in this sentence here, we can clearly see, and I'll put this in a different color here, um, that we have the rise in pitch at the beginning of the sentence and it rises rather high. And then we have a bit of a rise here before the pause. And that's telling the listener, I'm not done yet, just wait, all right? So we have that slight um, rise there and it continues over um, into the next thought group. And then we can see that we have a down pitch here telling the listener, okay, I'm done with my thought, all right? And if we uh, look at that again with the uh, model. He worked in kinesiology and helped athletes improve their movement. Okay, so he worked in kinesiology and we see that slight rise at the end of that thought, but it's telling us we're not finished yet and helped athletes improve their movement. And so then we bring it down, all right? So um, I would show them that there's that rise and that fall. And we can see here that in general, we've got a, a pattern of kind of working our way down to the end of that, that thought, okay? So, um, so there, there's the rise and the fall of pitch. Now, another basic rule that we can talk about with intonation is listing. And so listing has clear uh, intonational pattern. And so we can see this again in WASP with this sentence. So let me share that sentence with you. The students are studying business, graphic design, and English. Okay. And so again, here we see that we start on a rise. And again, usually it's the content word that is we rise up on that uh, stress part of it. And then um, here we see that with business, we're still on a rise here because again, that's telling us we're not done. And then we see with graphic design, which has a drop here before we uh, begin the rest 
of that thought group and we have a down pitch at the end telling us we're done with the, the sentence. And so we can see here again, the students are studying business, graphic design, and English. Okay. And so with that list, we have that carryover telling the listener, I'm not done, here's a few more, and then ending. All right. So those are some basic intonational patterns that we can point out to students that can help them to not only um, find the, into the pitch within their chunks, but also to know how to begin and end a thought. So let's see how that would look in a longer um, statement or sentences. Um, again, like I mentioned before, I like to use storytelling because it's, um, it's, there's more drama put to it. And so we can hear the emphasis on the different words and also the pausing. And so here I took um, a brief story by a speaker from TED Talk, and I'm only taking a chunk of this to show you. And I recorded it uh, while I was playing it. And I'll just let you hear this first part before I point out some things. Well, the subject of difficult negotiation reminds me of one of my favorite stories from the Middle East, of a man who left to his three sons 17 camels. And to the first son, he left half the camels. To the second son, he left a third of the camels. And to the youngest son, he left a ninth of the camels. Well, three sons got into a negotiation. 17 doesn't divide by two. It doesn't divide by three. It doesn't divide by nine. Brotherly temper started to get strained. Finally, in desperation, they went and they consulted a wise old woman. Okay. So, um, so now we're going to, um, I would put this up on the board with the students and we would together try to identify those different pitch patterns that we just talked about, but I would take it in chunks uh, so as not to overwhelm them. So first we would um, find the first, we would find the first chunk and then take a look at that. So let's listen for that. Well, the subject of difficult negotiation reminds me of one of my favorite stories from the Middle East. Okay. And so here we have the first chunk and we can identify that we're rising at the beginning of the sentence, and we have, um, oh, uh, let me put in this line here. This is our first chunk here. And we are falling at that pause. So he doesn't really end a sentence here, but he has a long pause before he finishes his thought, all right? And then we can continue from there. So let's continue here. A man who left to his three sons, 17 camels. Okay, and that's where he actually ends the sentence. And so we see here, he ends it right here. And he has um, noticed that he had that pause and came down low there, but then rises up again here. Oops, and I meant to use a different color there. Okay, so he rises here and it didn't change color. Sorry about that. And he has a fall, a deep fall here, ending that thought. Okay. So let's continue with this and let's continue from that point right here. And to the first son, he left half the camels. To the second son, he left a third of the camels. And to the youngest son, he left a ninth of the camels. Okay. So now, what do you notice? and anybody can shout out here, here's our next chunk, but what do you notice that he's doing in this thought group here? And let me play it again so we can hear what he's doing, let's see, right here. And to the first son, he left half the camels, to the second son, he left a third of the camels, and to the youngest son, he left a ninth of the camels. So based on what I've talked about with intonation, what do you notice there? Anyone? Good. Okay, there's some rising intonation. Yes. Now you said at the end, yes, there's a, a high rise there. 
All right, but notice again, if we follow that rule that we were talking about, let's take a look here. He starts that sentence phi here, and then he's listing. And so when he's listing the number of camels, we see that he's rising on each one because he's not done. And then we see a rise in Paul as he ends the sentence. Let's take a look at that again. Let's see that rise and fall. So let's begin right here. And to the first son, he left half the camels. To the second son, he left a third of the camels. And to the youngest son, he left a ninth of the camels. Okay, so half the camels, a third of the camels, and a ninth of the camels. All right, so we have a rise, fall, rise, fall, rise, fall. All right. Um, but he's not dipping real, real low until he gets the end of that thought. Now let's take a look at this last uh, chunk here. Well, three sons got into a negotiation. 17 doesn't divide by two. It doesn't divide by three. It doesn't divide by nine. Brotherly temper started to get strained. Finally, in desperation, they went and they consulted a wise old woman. Okay, so how does he begin that sentence? Does it begin high, low? Can we hear that again? Just that part? Yep. Okay, let's go back to that. Right here. Well, three sons got into a negotiation. 17 doesn't divide by two. It doesn't divide by three. It doesn't divide by nine. Brotherly temper started to get strained. Finally, in desperation, they went and they consulted a wise old woman. Okay, so can you see the pattern again there? Anybody want to, to analyze the pattern on, on this thought group? Let me play it one more time, right there. Camels. Well, three sons got into a negotiation. 17 doesn't divide by two. It doesn't divide by three. It doesn't divide by nine. Brotherly temper started to get strained. Finally, in desperation, they went and they consulted a wise old woman. Okay. So what do you notice with the intonation pattern? Contrastive stress. Okay. All right. And can you can you point out specific anything? Yeah. Here. So so we have that a, a good point on that contrastive stress. Um, in terms of pitch, where do we see that rise and fall? So notice again here. Well. He goes, he, he starts up high, right? And then on each one of the points, doesn't divide by two, doesn't divide by three, or whatever his numbers were. He's kind of carrying on and letting the, the listener know, I'm not done yet, I'm not done yet. And then at the end, I can't point it here, but he falls, okay? So we see that same kind of pattern of the rise at the beginning of the sentence, working its way down to the fall at the end of the sentence, but with that listing, telling the listener, I'm not done yet, I'm not done yet, now I'm done. Okay. Well, three sons got into a negotiation. 17 doesn't divide by two. It doesn't divide by three. It doesn't divide by nine. Brotherly temper started to get strained. Finally, in desperation, they went and they consulted a wise old woman. Now, another thing that can be pointed out, especially in presentations, um, when you're doing that, whenever you want to uh, emphasize or slow things down, you can pause more, like I mentioned before. And you notice that he does that at the end of that sentence. He, he has that rise in pitch, and then he kind of slows down at the end to bring that thought to a finish, okay? So, so this is how, I would analyze and work with the students to help them to, to see and hear those intonation changes, those pitch changes, and how that, that, that can be used in, um, in presentations, okay? So um, before, so that's basically it um, as far as uh, giving some examples and showing you a little bit about audacity and how to analyze 
uh, those portions with students. Um, any questions at this point? I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, I may have missed it. Did you say something about WASP? Is it free or is it uh, something that your, your university purchased? For no, it is free. It is free. Um, and I, that's something I probably should have put on a slide here are the links for this. Um, I can. Okay, so you know what? Um, after this is over, um, I can send out a message to all of our registrants. Mm -hmm. And if you have some resources that you'd like to share, um, mm -hmm. we can send it out at that time and then people can look at it later on. That sounds good. Okay, great. Any other questions or thoughts? So uh, I thank you very much and I'd like everyone to feel free to open your mics, turn on your mics and you know speak up and ask your questions or make your comments uh, orally. Um, thank you so much for uh, bringing these to our attention. Audacity is something that I've used for many, 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 many years and did a number of presentations on it. Um, and I think it's a really great tool to use for, um, well, for singing and for music and for language learning as well, which is what we're here for. So uh, yeah, we can send you some resources at the end of this presentation and it um, is being recorded. So if you were unable to attend from the very beginning, don't worry, you'll be able to watch it. And even if you were here, you can watch it again. And, and before, before we go, can I just really quick just share some responses from students on their experience with this? Sure. Um, uh, first of all, one of the things that was we found really interesting that students um, responded on the questionnaire and in the focus group was they thought that th um, understanding thought groups and chunking was extremely helpful to them. Um, they also felt it was helpful to understand intonation. It was difficult for some, especially for the Indian student, because if a student can't hear the pitch changes or the stress, then it's difficult for them to produce it. And so, so with that student, we had to work more on um, exaggeration. And so the model had to really exaggerate and then encourage him to exaggerate so he could actually feel the stress changes and the pitch change. But overall, students really thought understanding this made such a difference and the teachers saw the difference in their presentations once they understood how to chunk as they would prepare their speeches. Um, they also thought that the visuals helped to see rhythm patterns and um, breaking up thought groups as well as pitch changes. Um, they thought the visuals were helpful, but they didn't really like to compare to the model because they would get too frustrated because they felt like they had to be exactly like the model and they don't. Um, the idea, though, is to just get them used to hearing and identifying stress patterns and um, pitch changes. Um, they preferred instead to record and then get feedback from the teacher and then compare to their own uh, speech. So as they would get the feedback and then record again, they could see the adjustments. They also preferred doing this on their own rather than in a lab or a classroom because there was too much distraction with everybody else doing their, um, their practice. So, yes, question, Seth. Yeah, I'm wondering if the students might react more favorably to audacity uh, than was because of the, the visual representation. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking from a student standpoint that that might be clearer telling what they have to do and when. The WASP um, rendition reminds me of when we used uh, VisiPitch, that's a much earlier um, uh -huh. generation of technology, but I think the students kind of didn't really know what was being represented. You know, I mean, the longer vertical lines and... Yes. Um, I would agree. Of. Yeah, I would agree with that, Seth, because even though I went through that with them, um, it was more challenging than the audacity, so... Mm -hmm. But it, at least it gave them an idea of, or an understanding of pitch change. So, but you're right, it was more challenging. So one of the questions that came up with, uh, was, uh, Carolyn asked is which one is easier to use. And I think that um, Seth, you hit the hammer on the head because when you look at Audacity and you can see uh, waveforms, the sort of the bulkiness of 
you know, where the pitch changes, uh, sorry, not the pitching, the uh, stress changes are, um, are, are helpful. Whereas pitch, pitch is really difficult to, yeah. to, um, mm -hmm. to visualize as well as, um, to hear. Uh, I don't know if any of you were at the state conference last year in 2020. Uh, I gave a presentation on how to use audacity for a number of different purposes. And um, I am, well, it's in the queue for me to do something with a recording on that so that I can um, put it up there and uh, allow the rest of uh, the world to take a, take a look at it. So that might be something that could be useful depending on what level of student you're uh, working on. But that would probably be a little bit easier, but it doesn't show intonation, which apparently the program WASP does. So they do different things, as Carla yeah. pointed out at the very beginning of this. And, and mind you too, this was a pilot study and obviously more research would have to be done on, on this, but at least it gave, gave us an idea of how we could use these two tools and which was more helpful and just got get a sense of the needs of the students and what they felt they were able to gain from it. And Ra, uh, uh, Renee, uh, after I did this study with her, continued to use these methods for about six semesters beyond and um, found favorable responses from students. And again, one of the, the major areas they felt most helpful was just understanding thought groups and pitch patterns. Um, for presentations. Carla? Yes. Um, do you think there's any value? I thought it was really interesting, the feedback that um, they get discouraged, perhaps, comparing themselves to a native speaker. It creates kind of an unrealistic or too hard to achieve goal. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I show TED Talks of people with using the uh, people who have a common L1, but they're using and they're speaking in English and they're using the prosody really well, you know, good enough so that they're completely understandable and, you know, interesting to listen to, et cetera. Do you think there'd be any value to trying that approach in, you know, as a compliment? Like, you don't have to speak like me, but here's someone with your L1 speaking English who's doing a great job with all the super segmentals yeah. and maybe try to emulate them. On audacity. That's, that's a really interesting thought. I, I think that it would be valuable in the sense that they can at least see that I don't have to speak like a native speaker, right. but still right. be understood because the whole point of this research was to improve comprehensibility. Right. You know, you don't have to be uh, a native, you know, you don't have to achieve native speech, but you do want to be comprehensible. And if you can at least focus on the prosody, then that will help for your speech to be understandable to a native speaker, more clear. Mm -hmm. So yeah, very good point. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other? Yeah, Nate? Yeah, I was just, uh, I wanted just to add something here. So I feel like pitch is difficult because a lot of students don't know how to use it. They just don't have control over it. And so based on my experience, again, it's just me, what we did was adding vocal exercises mm -hmm. to that. So, so we distinguish very clearly here, you guys are raising your volume and here you're raising the pitch. Mm -hmm. And to do that, like I tried, uh, you know, vocal coaches and they go like, uh, they, they do things like, mm, go 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 mm -hmm. like it's this is a vocal exercise mm -hmm. done for singers originally but it's used for um kind of strengthening the control of the muscles and trying to switch mm -hmm. uh, seamlessly between different levels of pitch and once that is in place it's not a problem i assure you even with indian speakers they do great based on my experience i only taught All right. Well, that's it. Thank you so much, Carla, for bringing to our attention um, how you can use these two tools, Audacity and WASP, to help our students understand prosody 
um, there's a lot of teaching that goes along with it, just as you showed us in your final slide, uh, the different things that students learned from doing all of this process. And I think that um, a lot of us who've been teaching pronunciation have probably added this to our, our, um, our toolbox. And um, Princeton University, uh, she's one that I, uh, in one of my circles of pronunciation and super segmentals and prosody, uh, worldwide. Um, I've asked her to come over to Katisol to give us um, her take on doing some super, super segmental lesson planning. So she's from Princeton. Her name is Allison McGregor. Please note that instead of the third Friday, it is the fourth Friday. Um, that's not hard, but this is new and it's uh, going to be at uh, one o'clock time. Okay, so instead of our usual 11 a.m. Pacific time, it's going to be after lunch. So it'll be one o'clock. So um, I will be putting out more information on that. This is already available on the website, so you can go ahead and click on it and get it and get enrolled. If you do so, be sure that you do the thing that says um, download it into your, your calendar, or maybe there's a way that you like to filter your mail so all the important stuff with your Zoom links um go in in a safe, safe place besides that um we are having the state conference so at the state conference certainly we'll have stuff on pronunciation our state conference is going to be different this year it's going to be virtual again but instead it's going to be on two weekends so it'll be fridays and saturdays in the last weekend of october so october 29th and 30th and then the following friday and saturday november 5th and 6th and this is to get people um to give people a different kind of experience where instead of it's all packed into sitting behind a screen for that many hours we're trying to break it up so that it's shorter periods a day uh, over a longer period of time Okay, so um, if you are the type who would like to do a presentation, please note that there are um, that the proposals are open. If you are a member of Katisa, you already received all of this information two or three times in the Katisa update. Now, I know a lot of things come to your email box and some things you may just not look at right away and you think, oh, nobody ever told me. But in fact, we have told you, we have told you and and I'm telling you again that it is there. So if you are interested in submitting a proposal, there is a link that is available to you in the uh, updates. Now, for those of you who are not members, you haven't received this yet. And in my other hat as the web manager, I am trying to get all the information from the whole team of um, conference organizers so that I can um, open up so I can publish the website that is specifically for the state conference. So that will be coming soon. And of course, everything is available on katisal.org. All right. So I want to, again, thank you very much for joining us today out to end this presentation. And we'll see you again in the future. Thanks for coming. should continue to do so. Um, and it's good to know about the different kinds of tools that are available. So thank you very much. As I mentioned earlier, I'll be happy to send out um, post event um, some of the things that uh, Carla is willing to share with us um, through our um, uh, through email. And it won't be it won't be right away because I have to process the video and all that other stuff. Um, I'd also like to uh, call your attention to the survey 
I know that some of you have already submitted the survey, but it's quite possible that some of you have not actually gotten around to doing the submit button. So I'm going to put it in the chat. And if you look in your chat, you can see the link and you can click on the link. And then after we even leave this session, you'll be able to take a look at that survey. And um, if you haven't already participated, then I encourage you to do so because I haven't gone over the results yet and I would like to include as many as possible because we trying to make um, well I would like to say that I think that top is the greatest IG at Kitty song we have been having events every single month so uh, we're pleased to keep that up um, the other thing is that I know that several of you who are in this field have something to contribute please uh, ping me uh, chat with me Give me your 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 um, phone number if you'd like to if you've got an idea that you'd like to talk about because it's great to hear from a lot of people about different things that will help us as teachers learners or pronunciation. I also want to mention that there's still another more than a month left for your free access to um, AM English Online, which has many many programs or some thirty some of programs within it, including uh, ones on pronunciation, but also on vocabulary and, and building other kinds of skills like um, idioms and uh, grammar and so forth. So there is an opportunity for you as a teacher to bring your class along without having to pay anything. Um, and afterwards, then there is an awesome very cheap way of continuing, which is only $5 a student per year. All right, so that's available and you can in you can just email info at Sunburst Media to get um, to get set up for that. I'd like to let you know that next month we are having a topic which is along the same lines. It's going to be a super segmental lesson planning hands on kind of a workshop. So um, this will be brought to you by uh, a colleague at and look forward to hearing from you in many different ways. And uh, katisal.org, that's our mom, that's our mother, that's our, that's the place where you can find most of the information. Thank you so much. I'm about I think like about 10 students from start to finish, meaning like the mm -hmm. whole, the full circle one whole year of accent reduction, but I really feel by avoiding pitch, we're just doing a disservice because audacity, it's volume, it has nothing to do with pitch. And then they, especially again, I have a Russian language background, mm -hmm. um, have Russian language background. So for me, if you show that to me, I would just use volume all the time because right. I don't use pitch in my first language. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think it's more it's more difficult for sure. And at first they have no idea what you're talking about, but mm -hmm. it's so critical that we te teach them to how to use their voice to show pitch changes. That yeah. is an excellent point. And I was gonna bring that up, that that was the issue that our Indian student had. He kept hitting it harder, and but it was still monotone. And, and that was something that um, we talked about with him and worked with him is um, you're right. It's it's a vocal shift, and so you know working on you know da 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 to hear you know student student you know we have that rise and fall. It's not student you know we're not putting emphasis there. And I think that's excellent. And and you could probably use some of those vocal changes with WASP just to to see that rise and fall. You know, maybe that would be an easier way to use WASP instead of like Seth said, you know, seeing all those jags in the sentence could get them lost, but just letting them see the rise and fall in da 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 da. Or even just one vowel, like, oh, so right. what do we do? We go up, down, or down, up, down again. Mm -hmm. And then we go, uh, oh. Mm -hmm. So that way we go the other way around. So at least they start to realize, okay, I can go in two directions. Mm -hmm. How does it feel when mm -hmm. I do either one? So excellent, excellent point. Yeah, I would agree. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or thoughts? Well, this was wonderful. I really appreciate this. I I had one. Um, we have until twelve fifteen, right, uh, Marsha? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
I just had one last quick question I wanted to throw out there. Um, as I mentioned, we're working on a master's in TESOL and one of the classes we would like to uh, have is uh, teaching second language pronunciation or teaching pronunciation to second language learn, um, learners. And um, if you were to take a master's course in TESOL, what would you like to be seeing within a course like that? Or should it really focus on speaking and listening? Any thoughts? Seth, did you? Uh, I think it would be, I think that sounds like an, an ideal course for perspective. These are going to be uh, teachers. Mm -hmm. taking that. Yeah, because, um, you know, it's it's challenging to find a way to to get this to really transmit the information and the practice to the students. I think sometimes to get the to have the students uh, mm -hmm. fully produce what maybe the listener expects to hear for comprehension. If that makes sense. Yes. I mean, I think uh, I think that would be important in addition to listening and speaking. Mm -hmm. Class yeah, because speaking. yeah. Because one of the things that, I mean, you guys are all uh, passionate about uh, pronunciation, but it's one of the things that we tend to overlook, like in language programs. And, um, and part of the problem is, is that many, many teachers or, or TESOL teachers haven't been trained in how to teach pronunciation. They basically just kind of follow a book and maybe there's only a little section there on pronunciation. So this was one of the reasons why we were thinking it might be helpful to actually provide a course that shows the importance of teaching pronunciation in speaking and listening. So um, anyways, any other thoughts?